I'm very much of the opinion that God has a sense of humor a lot like mine. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe I'm getting a sense of humor a lot like his. You know, kind of like seeing how people are and discovering that irregardless of what we think we want, we really don't know what we want. Because often when we get it, we find out we didn't want it. At least, I don't know about you, but that's the way I am. You know. I remember talking to God, you know, and saying, you know, Lord, every day is the same. We shouldn't get so carried away about making one day special and, you know, neglect the other days. And so, I used to say, don't shut the church down, keep the church open. You know, because I, at one time, had been part of a real small community church, and I was talking to the Lord about it. You know, they had a big, bad snowstorm, and they shut the church down so that people didn't come. And I walked all the way to church that day in the snow, cross town, in Oregon, freezing, so to speak. And, uh, you know, had a wonderful time, really, going there. And... You know, some miracles happened along the way where Jesus wrote in the snowbank and I wrote back, you know, and then I came back by and he wrote in the snowbank. It's kind, of, it kind of an interesting thing, you know. It's a big miracle, but I'll tell you about that some other time. The point is this. I got an attitude about it. You know, I carried it for a lot of years, you know, that I used to keep saying, hey, I don't want to change things. I want things to, you know, you can count on it. You know, like you could go to church and count on it being there. So I have to laugh because just this last week, you know, I was kind of like... Oh, wow, you know, it's kind of cool, you know, Passover's coming, you know. So I wonder if this new church does anything for Passover. Well, no, they don't. Yeah. Oh, cool, you know, so I said, oh, what if they do anything special for Easter? And I was like, well, no, they don't. I went, oh, cool. Now, I want somebody to do something neat. <laughs> you know, you just, once you get it, you don't want it. You want something else. And the truth is, I don't really care, you know, I mean, I'll be straight up. For me, you know, I, I've gone to pageants, performances, you know, the things that really, in my mind, are done more for families and kids and putting on plays and productions for other reasons than for the actual season that they are part of, you know, kind of like Christmas plays, you know, you put on Christmas plays at Christmas, you know, you kind of do those things. Well, now there's churches that are actually like megalopolis kind of like movie set kind of multiplex events going on at, you know, Easter, you know, I was like, huh, you know, I think that's interesting. So why don't they just go ahead and have an Easter bunny then? I mean, you can have fun with an Easter bunny. You know, go out on Easter egg hunts and things like that. See, I used to think that, and I still do, well, I should say, I do think that you can have fun with the Easter bunny and you can still be celebrating Easter and you could still do Passover, you know, all of them, because they all fall on different days if you just paid attention to what the Bible was saying in the first place. Enjoy it. You know, I mean, what's wrong with going to church, you know, like a sunrise service? And then in the afternoon, have an Easter egg hunt. Hey, I'm all for that. You know, give me some sugar, candy. You know, let me go out and play. I'm a big kid anyways. You know, I always felt like sunrise service was kind of neat, you know, because you get up at sunrise, you know. And that's a good discipline once in a while to learn how to do. Although, I got to admit, I get up a long time before sunrise. <laughs> oh, well. Just my habit. But the point I'm trying to make is that no matter what I thought I wanted, when I got it, it wasn't what I thought it was, then I wanted something else. The old idea about the grass is greener on the far side of the hill, 
green, green, it's green, they say, on the far side of the hill. Anybody know the Kingston Trio? No? Oh, well. The point being is that we all have expectations and we have realizations. The expectation of our hope is the soon revelation of Jesus Christ coming in all his glory. And when he comes, yeah, he's going to rule and reign, you know, in Jerusalem, you know, and sit in, you know, the throne of David, you know, and proclaim himself, you know, and name himself as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we'll all bow the knee, you know, and things will go on for, you know, a thousand years, and we'll see what it's like to be under Jesus, you know. Doesn't mean we're going to be messianic, it just means we're going to see what it's like, you know, I mean, there are certain things that we know will happen, some things that people speculate will happen, and some things I think they're wrong <laughs> that will happen, but oh well. But in the meantime, there's a lot of things that God, our Father, really wants us to just enjoy where we're at doing, wherever we're at. He wants us to have a realization of the observation of the things that are all around us at the moment we're in them. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart, as it says in the provocation, or look at my office. Man, you know, I've always wanted an office. You know, study. Now, some of you have man caves. I don't want one. First of all, just the name man cave. I've been in caves. I'm not going spedunkling. You know what spedunkling is? Investigating caves. I don't want to go in your man cave and investigate what you got on the videos or what you're doing there in a the computer room or party room or whatever you call it. Maybe, you know, it's like a family entertainment center. Okay. That makes sense. We used to call them a living room. Modern times, modern ways. But you know, I meet men that have man caves and I look at it and it's like they're becoming childlike or actually like little children dressed up, you know, in football jerseys and painting their faces and acting like idiots, you know, in order to celebrate what they didn't get a chance to be a part of when they were kids growing up and getting involved in all this kind of like, you know, acting stupid in order to somehow make it seem like it's part of, you know, like supporting their team. I don't know about you, but if you were going to support me, I wouldn't want you to act like an idiot to do it. You know, I don't know if Jesus is all that thrilled about it either. It's kind of like, it doesn't really look like what I think of as being a boring Christian. Although we Jesus freaks were pretty crazy. You know, we used to put on our, you know, Jesus shirts, you know, and our bumper stickers. And we'd run down the street throwing out tracks and talking to people until Keith Green came along. And then he said, look, you and your Christian bumper stickers. And was like, oh, whoa. We had a reality check. Sometimes... We all need a reality check. Why are we doing what we're doing? In other words, this weekend is Good Friday, and you know, there's like Easter Sunday and Sunrise Resurrection Sunday, if you want to call it that, or you know, some people are embarrassed to call it Easter. Because for some reason, they got this wild idea that it came from Ishtar, which is an Easter. <laughs> But they want to meet stir, you know, which really, me, you ought to put in the dumpster, you know, and just get out of the stir completely. You know, quit stirring up things that aren't there. Rather, you know, on the other side, I'm sure you've run into someone that goes, Oi! <laughs> Not oink, Oi! You know, you should do Passover. You know, you got to do a Seder. You know, because Seder, hater. You know, otherwise, if you don't do a Seder, you're a hater. Uh, such a deal. You know, it's for the children of Israel to celebrate. If you want to do a Seder, do a Seder. I think you got communion. It's a good thing. It can be a bad thing. It can be a neither one thing. But the point is, God wants us to remember and observe what he's done in your life. That's what the Seder was about. It never was about just simply the children of Israel remembering, you know, Egypt and you know their salvation was provided for by, you know, the blood atonement sacrifice coming over the 
you know, house and a dwelling place, and that God was going to deliver them out of the world, and all the different plagues are going to represent different things in your life that you're going to go through. Did you know that? And that you're going to experience all these things, you know? And the best way to get through them is to listen to the word of the Lord. You know, have to go through it as being led by the Lord, you know, and going through them and not trusting in your own efforts and intentions and never having to worry about, you know, what the world is doing against you because after all, you know, you don't even know what's going on anyway because you're just following Moses where he's going, you know, and he's going to split the waters, you're going to pass through, and you're going to go over that zone on dry land. That's going to stand as a heap, you know, and you're going to find out that you need to remember and observe those things because you'll forget about them and you'll forget where you came from, and then you'll leave your first love, and then you'll be kind of like destitute and, you know, miserable and wandering in the wilderness for 40 years until you perish, and then you'll be thinking that you were part of the ones that were in the world that should have been in the Spirit of God and you led by the Spirit of God. You met some of them like that. <laughs> okay, maybe not. You see, there's always someone wanting you to do something more than what God wants you to enjoy. You see, the Lord is always imploring you and calling you that He says, if you will seek my face, if you will hear my voice. If today you harden not your heart, it's always a big question mark because you really do have the choice to do what you want to do. And if you do, it's doo-doo because most of the time when people choose to do what they want to do, you got enough do's in the sentence that it turns out as doo-doo. That's the way I figured it out. If I got to do more than just simply obey, I might as well throw it away because you know what? I can obey, but when I do, well, you know what happens, I just said it. You start talking about do, then you got to do what to do with the do that you did, because what you're doing is what you think you should do, because you don't know what to do, and that if you had asked, it would be obey, not to do. And so, a lot of people get into this law thing, where they make do-do out of what God meant for instructions. Did I oversimplify? Not really, if you thought about it. You see, you could take that oversimplification of terminology, but I can make it into a dissertation of theology and show you how the homiletic fits the hermeneutic of it, and there is a complete dialectic and didactic of what I just enunciated and articulated in a way of the perspective of the observation of what God sees in his perspective when it is the reality of our objectivity making it subjective rather than <laughs> I can't come up with an if I was going to come up rather than a live you know object live object no but the point being is that no, you know, in the sentence structure, and you kind of play with the English, you know, and you can make it grammar grammatically correct, you know, kind of twist it a little bit, you know, and it comes back to being accurate biblically. I know how. I can do both sides of the coin. You know, I can rip, hop, hip, hop, bebop it. You know, dude, you got to get it where you got it when you want it. You got to get it when he's got it because he's got it when you live it, when you live it, when you do it, when you want it, and where it's at, what's that going to be, what you get, when you don't do what you do, that's supposed to do, when he says what to do, when you do, when you do, what he says to do. Yeah, see, I got it. <laughs> if you follow that, hey, man, be rapid, Jap. But the point is, God wants us to be aware of the times and the seasons. Not just to do them, but just to enjoy them. And so, when you get carried away about, you know, well, you know, you don't want to do the bunny, you know, or you don't want to do the egg, you know, or you you don't want to do the, you do want to do the Friday or the Thursday, you know, or you want to argue about which day, it's really not that important. God don't care anyway. Not really, because you see, when he cared, he sent his son. That's what he cared about. And with the whole point of all these days and seasons and times and, you know, things that come up, it's always about his son, not about what you do, because that's about you. You know, you and do seem to go together. You know, you do, who do, who do, you know, boo do, <laughs> well, do do. <laughs> but... When you really put it back into the sun, he's the one, you know, and you kind of, you can rhyme limerick it, you know, and kind of get really some spiritual truths out of it, because 
That's who it's all about. It's never been about you so much as what you're doing as what you're learning. And if you're learning, then you're growing in the knowledge of God and not what to do in certain times and seasons. You know, like, oh my God, it's Sabbath. You know, we need to sit on our hands, lay in our tents, and lay on the side because we're supposed to be sleeping during that day. You know, I'm not really getting up and walking outside of our tent because it's the heat of the day. <laughs> oh, you mean they have that in there too? Well, you know, you didn't read it, did you? Oops. Oh well, you know, so rest meant sleep, huh? Oh, yeah. Gee, if I've been wandering six days, you know, in the wilderness of a hot desert climate, I think I'd want to take a day off and recuperate. Maybe drink a little bit of water too. <laughs> soak it in and soak it up because you're going to sweat for the rest of the week. But people will take out of context a lot of the things God wants to put in the volume of the book and that's where we all need to have our appreciation in what's the volume of your learning experience today does it just begin and end from eight to nine and then you know you're suddenly kicked back and lay back the rest of the day or are you learning all through the day and all through the night you dwell in his promises you walk in his light I don't know that's between you and him but for me I notice things. I notice how much this office has grown in its beauty and its splendor. What a glorious sight it is right now to some people that are sitting in snowbanks looking at this behind me and going, spring's coming. Look, he recorded that the same day that it snowed hard on my porch. <laughs> Spring is coming. Only it's already here in California. <laughs> And where I'm at, hey, I got tomato plants blooming. <laughs> what can I say? That's also how different perspectives at different times, God wants to use them for different reasons and different seasons and different object lessons that we go through. So when I look at my church I'm going to, and you know, like maybe this week they don't do a big, you know, foo for you know, for Sunday or Resurrection Day or Easter. I figure it's probably because most of the people are already going to something else. <laughs> Anyways, you know, no, I don't think they got a football game. <laughs> but if I wanted to, and I don't, go to some pageant, and I don't want to. You know, I'd go to some you know, pageant and see it and say, oh, that's nice. You know, that's, that's such a deal. Because Boys, most of the time, I spent most of my life not sitting in front of the pageantry, but behind the scenes helping to produce whatever it was that was going on, whether it be the pageantry or the, the sound system or the chair setup or just picking up trash. I mean, you know, one time I was, you know, I think about it, I was even marching for Jesus. I don't remember if March for Jesus was during Easter or not, but anyways, just seemed like kind of somewhere around there. I forget when the March for Jesus is. It seems like it was in March, maybe. But I remember marching through downtown Anchorage, you know, dancing. I was a dancer. So, sure enough, they had this big, you know, hoopla about, hey, we need dancers. And I went, Christian church asking for dancers? Hey, he got my name. <laughs> Whoa! And I was there. There were only two guys, but there was like, I think there was 12 of us? No, was there six of us or 12 of us? I think there was 12 of us. So there was two guys and ten girls, you know, and it was great, you know, we did, you know, kind of like a stage thing, and the choreographer was from Louisiana, and he was professional, you know, so it was kind of fun, we did a pretty good job. And uh, the fun of it, though, was more of getting ready for it than it was really of actually doing it. When I was doing it, I was just like, kind of like, you know, I don't know, I was kind of like in a Never Never Land someplace else, but... When we were doing it, you know, I'd mess up all the time. I'd laugh about it, you know, and say, I got it, don't worry. You know, it's not because I'm a great dancer, but because I like it. You know, it's like I'm inspired at the moment. And when we did it, we performed. But they cleaned up so fast afterwards, it was like it was there, we did it, we got it, and gone. You know, it was like once the performance was there, it wasn't as much fun as the getting ready was. And that's kind of what God likes about us right now. We're getting ready for a big event. Our lives are being prepared for the greatest celebration in heaven of all time.
For the complete realization of our salvation and the hope of our calling is still yet to be accomplished in the marriage supper of the Lamb, when Jesus himself actually will be seen to have purchased back the world and all of creation as his footstool. And then he'll marry his wife, the bride that we are. And we'll all sit down at a marriage supper of the Lamb to enjoy the fellowship of the spirit beings that are there, as well as each other for whom we have been come into his presence, enjoying one another in a unity we have never known before. Now that, I can get excited about. So until then, it's kind of like, it's all dress rehearsal. This is all kind of like practicing and getting ready for it. And maybe you find yourself too consumed with the things that aren't important rather than the things that are important. You know, not the dress rehearsals, but the final act, the final scene. You know, the play that's yet to be performed, the passion play that's about to happen when we are impassioned with the fullness of God in us as God will be with us forevermore. Follow your guide. I am with you to guide you and to help you. Unseen forces are controlling your destiny. Your petty fears are groundless. What of a man walking through a glorious glade who fretted because there lay a river and he might not be able to cross it? Oh no, there's a river. When all the time the river was spanned by a bridge. He just didn't see it until he got there. And what if that man had a friend who knew the way, who had planned it, and assured him that no part of the journey, no part of the way or the path that he has taken would have any unforeseen contingency arise and that it's okay, you're going to make it all as well. I've got it planned for you. You just got to take this path and not that one. So leave your foolish fears and follow me, your guide, and determinedly refuse to consider the problems of tomorrow because my message for you is today to trust and to wait. More than often, I think when we read about the disciples, like especially in the upper room waiting, they had no idea what was to come. I think sometimes in your life the same thing is true. You may be experiencing an Easter week or a Passover week or some kind of, you know, like uh, Easter bunny preparations, you know, getting the eggs ready and decorating them. I mean, those are kind of neat. You can always smell when, you know, somebody's doing Easter eggs. You know, it's like, can you smell that? Yeah, it was kind of like the, what is it, the, uh, uh, I started to say apple cider. It's not apple cider. It's, um, oh, boy, when you get older, your mind goes, whoop, whoop. You know, stay in the Word of God, you're fine. Stay outside the Word of God, guess what? It's gone somewhere. Cuckoo, fly by. Um, but the, um, Boy, it's right on the tip of my tongue. It's not the alcohol thing, it's the... Oh. Nyom! <laughs> a low flying plane, a hummingbird just went by. Um, forget, but you know what I mean. When you were doing Easter eggs, you'd get those little Haas Easter egg coloring kits, you know, they had the little, you had to put the little whatever in it, you know, it smelled so bad, you know, it smelled so strong, you know. Then you decorated your eggs, you know, and don't tell me you didn't have fun doing that. Come on, you're not so serious, it's like, you know, too serious, are you? So, whether you're decorating eggs or whether you're celebrating, you know, Pesach, you know, and you're, you're Hagsameach all over the place, you know, and you're getting your lamb ready, you know, and you're kind of, you know, Hametz here and Hametz there and getting rid of Hametz everywhere, you know. <laughs> you know, you get your little feather and your candle and you're kind of like checking it out to make sure everything's gone. You know, or you're slaughtering some sheep, you know, somewhere, <laughs> God help you. <laughs> but that's, you know, Passover. Or whether you're doing it, you know, in just the fullness of the joy of just enjoying whatever it is you're doing. One thing that God always wants us to recognize is to not fear. Because fear tends to move us away from what God wants us to experience from Him in all of our days. Not just the good days and not just the bad days. Not just the celebration days, and not just the fasting days. Not the days when you think that, oh my God, the Supreme Court's going to make a bad decision, or your tax bill's going to come due, or you know, 
Oh, no, I got the x-ray back. It's what I thought. Who cares? Because you have something to look forward to. You have a hope that's greater than the temporal things that are happening around you. The permanent promise is you are assured of a reservation at a table you have yet to sit down to and a banquet you've yet to feast at and a place that's been reserved with your name on it and your new name is inscribed there right there in your seat right there in front of you where you get to sit down and go ooh so that's what Jesus calls me stupid <laughs> not kidding hey you gotta have a sense of humor about this but really what do you fear what are you worried about God is with you God saved you God died for you there's nothing more you need fear death where does thy sting it's gone away huh I got nothing to worry about kill me who cares you know I ain't worried about it I'm going to heaven I don't worry about it I'm going to heaven so you know I don't understand people with their fears of you know, guns and protections and devices and worries and anxieties. Hey, take it all. I know when I hear the call, I'm going home. Now, you may see me as, you know, maybe I died from a car accident or something, but not me, man. I heard the call and I was gone. You know, I was like, out of here, dude, you know. Checked out. <laughs> Checked in where I'm supposed to be. And that's the point of where you need to bring your faith to. You need to bring the understanding of what God brings you through, you're heading towards a final destination. And it's not like the movie where you're going to, no matter what, you're going to die. <laughs> no, you will die, the physical body. But your final destination isn't the grave. Oh, no, far from that. Your destination, if you made your reservation, is in heaven. And you have a place at the seat of the Father's table that Jesus himself probably, I may be wrong, but I'm thinking it's probably true, will come and serve you personally. And I think that is what's going to amaze all of us. Because we'll try to be like Peter and say something stupid like, Oh no, Lord, don't, don't, don't serve me. You know? <laughs> if it happens, just don't go there. No, 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 no. But you know, really, I mean, Jesus said he came not to be served, but to serve. Perhaps it may be at the marriage supper of the Lamb, we may find it's not the Lamb that's the main course, but rather God revealing to us how He wants us to be in the millennium because He'll show us at the marriage supper of the Lamb really what it's like to wash the feet. Imagine, if you will, this Easter, you know, this Passover, this Resurrection Day, whatever you want to call it. Imagine, if you will, being teleported, transported, shot forth into heaven. And there, in the midst of perfection, is the only imperfect thing in the universe. Someone so marred and so scarred that, yes, his eyes are like fire, and his hair white as flaxen, but his face is marred beyond recognition and his beard plucked as though torn out by his roots. And he appears as a lamb slain before the foundations of the world. When I look to the lamb of God that was slain, and I know that in heaven at the mention of his name, all the angels fall. Who am I to stand? Am I not to blame for the lamb that was slain? I always read this one scripture that says, Kiss the son lest he be angry. I often wonder, it may be, when we get to heaven, you'll see a face so hard as it'll come to you. Remember that scripture. Kiss the sun, lest it be angry. Because he won't be look, looking like someone you want to kiss, like the beautiful pictures. He'll be looking like someone that has died for your sins and mine. And we'll always we'll be reminded of that every time we see Jesus. Oops. <laughs>